Doesn't it seem like every few weeks there's a new study that the media landscape is up in arms about? Maybe my ear is too close to the ground considering, well, it's my field. Still, it seems constant. We are here to discuss if sugar alcohols like xylitol and erythritol are going to stop your heart and send you to an early life retirement. And it's all due to this study. Xylitol is a sugar substitute that's found in many low carb foods, processed foods, and even some dental items. However, your body also produces it. As I mentioned, xylitol has now been linked to cardiovascular disease, and we'll see if that's true or not. But I'd like to, in consulting speak, loop in another study that shows the same results, but for erythritol here. So now we have two studies indicating the same scary situation. Should we run for the hills? Last time I made that reference in editing, we accidentally added uh, the Iron Maiden song, The Trooper, instead of Run to the Hills, and got called out by my fellow metalheads. So allow me to correct that here. Should we run to the hills? Oh yeah, I absolve myself of my metal sins. Okay, back to the study. The researchers of this study took data from two different groups of people. One group, called the Discovery Cohort, had blood sampled, and then the researchers performed a research technique called an untargeted metabolomics. Essentially, they probed for many metabolites in the blood and then associated that to a three-year follow-up of these people to see who had cardiovascular events like heart attacks, strokes, etc., the idea being that if one metabolite is much higher in people who suffer from a CVD event, that's cardiovascular event, then they can focus on that metabolite. They ended up discovering that xylitol-like molecules, metabolites, associated well with CVD events. But because this was untargeted, they needed greater sensitivity to separate out xylitol specifically. That's where the validation cohort comes in, the second group to validate the results with a technique called targeted metabolomics. See how that works? <laughs> now, they had the sensitivity to identify xylitol specifically, but don't take my word for it. I'm just a dude on the interwebs. Let's look at the data. Here, I'm showing you the validation cohort data. On the left, we see a graph with the event-free survival, meaning that the percentage of people who have not experienced any cardiovascular event, remember that's heart attack, stroke, etc. The higher the line, the better the outcomes. So you don't want the lines to go down. The horizontal axis is the number of years of follow-up. That's a three years total. So we're comparing the T1 with those with the lowest concentration of blood xylitol, to T2, those with a moderate amount, and T3, those with the greatest amount of xylitol. You now understand the worry, don't you? <laughs> it looks like a stepwise reduced cardiovascular event survival with increasing xylitol levels. This was further illustrated in the graph on the right, with the dotted line 1 being the risk of the T1 group and the dots and lines representing the elevated risk relative to T1. If they move to the right, there's increased MACE risk, which is a measure of cardiovascular disease events. The unique aspect here is that the red dots and lines are an adjusted analysis. So the researchers are removing potential confounding factors that might explain the increased risk, such as age, sex, smoking, diabetes, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol-containing lipoproteins, triglycerides, and an inflammation marker, C-reactive protein. As you can see, the T3 condition still shows significantly elevated risk. Are you <laughs> slowly removing that xylitol-filled gum from your mouth yet? Well, that's not all the data. Another experiment they did was in mice, because this experiment would be illegal to do in humans. They performed a thrombosis assay, which means that they injured the blood vessels of mice to activate them to clot and repair the injury. However, they did this after injecting an inert substance, that's the vehicle seen here, or injected xylitol. 
if you want to look at the micrographs, the more white that there is, the more clotting happened. As you can see, both conditions clotted, which is a good thing. But look at the times that it took to clot. The xylitol exposed condition clotted much faster. This is also shown in the graph on the right. The red xylitol condition is lower, indicating less time elapsed to clot. Now, by itself, that's not a bad thing. We need to clot, but it simply shows that xylitol can have a potent effect on thrombosis, the aggregation of platelets into a clot. If it is pathological, it can completely stop blood flow in finer veins and arteries. I don't know about you, but I enjoy my blood flow, although it sometimes fails to reach the humor side of my brain. I actually didn't think that was too bad. I think it fit pretty nicely. Still physiological and still related, so I'll give that one an 8 out of 10. Got good blood flow today. <laughs> Next, they repeated this experiment in humans, whole blood. Remember, it would be illegal to cause damage to someone's arteries and watch it get clogged up after injecting them with xylitol. So the next best thing is to remove blood, expose it to a microchip with collagen on it, and then expose xylitol and the vehicle, that's the inert substance, remember, independently to the blood and collagen. Then the more green that you see means that there's more platelets that have bound to the collagen chip indicating greater aggregation of platelets. We can see a quantification on the right side over three minutes time. I probably don't need to spell it out for you. I'm assuming uh, the xylitol exposed human blood aggregated onto the collagen much more than the vehicle, which is the correct comparison. They did many experiments using different uh, other activating molecules but I'd like to focus on the highlights. The paper reference is linked for you if you'd like to deep dive into it for yourself. Now, we know that people with more blood xylitol correlate with increased CVD risk. We know that xylitol increases aggregation of platelets and clot formation. Next, we should probably find out if consuming normal day-to-day -day amounts of xylitol will even budge our blood xylitol levels. It's estimated that xylitol consumers eat or drink on average around 30 grams of xylitol. So the researchers gave 30 grams of xylitol to people and measured their blood values over 24 hours. Each line represents a single person. The vertical axis is the amount of blood xylitol and the horizontal axis is the 24 hours of measurement. You can see the blood xylitol levels start below one micromolar and the peak is around, I don't know what, like seven, 800 micromolars, something like that. Now for reference, the amount found to be associated with increased CVD events was a measly 30 micromolar and even less than that. The researchers have drawn a dotted line for the 30 micromolar cutoff. So these people had above believed dangerous levels for about 30 to 60 minutes. However, keep in mind that the risk was also seen at values as low as a few micromolar, meaning these people were in the at risk concentration for at least six hours and probably longer after one 30 gram consumption of xylitol. You also notice that three people had their lines go up and they didn't have the lines go further into measurement. That's because they suffered massive coronary heart attacks and died. I'm kidding. It was just measurement error and inability for them to be remeasured. So they removed their data points. <laughs> Could you imagine? Okay, I won't go through all the data again, but there is an erythritol study, a similar sugar alcohol to xylitol, that also shows these same effects. Just as a quick glance, does this look familiar? The Q4 is the highest blood erythritol levels. Okay, enough doomsday. By now, you've spit out your sugar-free gum and thrown the whole pack in the trash. Well, you may want to pull it back out. Or not. We'll see. Obviously, these studies took a lot of work, and I do like aspects of them, like the fact that they used a reasonable dose to indicate the overall burden of xylitol on blood at xylitol levels. Or some of these aggregation assays, many of which I didn't show you for time's sake. I also like the fact that they did an adjusted analysis on the association because it strengthens the argument. 
That all said, there are some undercover problems that haven't been addressed. For example, if we pop open the validation cohort data again, the T3 condition there is yes, high in xylitol, and yes, it's adjusted for many factors. But if you open the baseline data on these participants in both the xylitol study and the erythritol study, they also have higher rates of previous cardiovascular disease. They take more drugs for their health and they have worse kidney health, among other differences. So while the researchers adjusted for some factors, they didn't adjust for all of them. Plus, even if they had, it seems clear to me that the T3 and even the T2 group were in worse overall health, which is not something that you can just adjust for statistically. For example, if you remove all the diabetic individuals, that still doesn't account for the people that have had previous heart problems and may be pre-diabetic. The overall background of these people, their overall health is different, which is a huge contributor to their risk of cardiovascular disease. It's an entirely different story when you have two groups of people that are the same health at the beginning, except they differ in one factor because then you can adjust for that factor. That isn't the case here. Additionally, we're looking at xylitol blood levels, but we're not talking about consuming xylitol. Yes, there were some short-term experiments, but all these data culminate in a patchwork of evidence that relies on assumptions that they tie into one another. For example, I understand it's worrisome to see data indicating xylitol increases clotting when activated to clot, and that's important. It doesn't just cause clotting on its own. But other studies have also indicated that xylitol improves other mechanisms of cardiovascular function, like endothelial function. As a matter of fact, that study that I just referenced is a Mendelian randomization trial, which means that it looks at xylitol-related genes and tries to find associations between these genes and disease risk. It's a, honestly, it's a pretty lackluster explanation, but time is money and money is time or I don't know, something like that. The point is, it's another way of assessing xylitol risk. And they concluded there was no relationship between xylitol and cardiovascular disease. I have some small issues with this study too, though, so it's not perfect. And I don't think that it absolves xylitol entirely. Unfortunately, we don't have any prospective studies on xylitol or long-term randomized controlled trials looking at its cardiovascular risk. And just because I brought up some confounders to this analysis does not mean that xylitol couldn't be the culprit. However, since we only have a handful of studies, it's impossible to get a clear idea. That said, using it for dental and not ingesting it is probably not a big worry. And I understand that consumption is also a common use. And it's true that 30 grams did lead to a significant rise, but again, the long-term data was in blood levels, not consuming xylitol. Additionally, all the aggregation assays indicating xylitol increases blood clotting were done at a concentration of 30 micromolar. But let me clue you in on one more piece of data here. This is another aggregation assay with the higher levels on the vertical axis indicating greater thrombosis. But I want you to pay attention to the horizontal axis. Notice that the effect is only statistically significant at 30, 100, and 300. And notice the effect size at 300, which is 10 times what people are exposed to in blood for 60 minutes. Only increased aggregation by 2.46 fold. And consider that generally your xylitol levels will be well below 10 micromolar, which according to this assay shows no effect. So am I worried based on this and the erythritol study alone? No, I'm not. However, I am open to future studies that actually show a more robust cause and effect. So my question for you is, did you take your xylitol gum out of the trash or not? Anyway, allow me to freak you out in this next video right here. I'll speak with you over there.